this is story of Vlad the Impaler, all parts. This is the new channel. Knowledge? Knowledge? Oh well. Um, this is all parts. I'm going to break it down in the parts. And um, let's go. During a time of immense change and transition, one of the world's most enigmatic and contentious rulers were born. Vlad III, Dracula, son of Vlad II, Dracul, and later known as Vlad Zepesh, or the Impaler. Vlad was born in the Transylvanian city of Zhigishara, likely near the end of the year 1431. While currently located in Transylvania, due to his father's designation as military governor of the region, Dracula was in fact a future candidate for the position of Voivode of Wallachia. According to Wallachian tradition, any son of a previous Voivode was eligible to fill the role, and given that young Dracula was the legitimate son of a later two-time holder of the title, it comes as no surprise that his focus seldom strayed from the throne. Supplementarily, Dracula's grandfather, Mircea Cialbaltran, was and is considered one of the most monumental rulers of Wallachia in his era. This ancestry and birthright meant that Vlad Dracula was inevitably going to become part of a bitter and bloody feud between the two warring lines of the House of Basarab, the Daneshti and the Draculeshti. I consider the matter urgent. That of your Skip succession, it. the Iron Throne, the most dangerous seat Skip. in the world. Dra so one of the most common new Why does it take me to the next are doing right now when we take Redwood is to stack it with our brand new fat burning stuff. Skip. I've been it's all today. I skip an ad. I click skip. It takes me to the next ad. Before he could be a proper contender to the Valachian throne, Vlad Dracula was raised by the woman of his household in Jigishara like any young boy of his prestige. He would have been taught all the basic necessities of princehood, such as their native language, basic manners, correct dress code, and of course, the idea that he was superior to other men and destined for sovereign greatness. The boys would have also spent a substantial amount of time maintaining their physical fitness, starting at a young age, and being held to somewhat Spartanistic standards when not learning, training, or likely messing around as children do in their free time. Vlad would have also attended church with the rest of his family. His parents, at this time, were Catholic, but it is possible that Dracula and his youngest brother Radu were baptized in an Orthodox church. This, of course, would be significant, given the importance of the Orthodox faith to the Valachian leadership. The boy... When was he trained to turn into a bat and fly around and drink people's blood? Let's get to the good stuff. Stop teasing me with all this. He's likely attended Catholic Mass on a regular basis while living in Transylvania. After a support change by Emperor Sigismund, Vlad Dracul was finally able to secure his place as Voivode of Wallachia, moving the family's Voivode. home to the capital city of Targoviste by the start of 1437. Here, Dracula's life would have begun to change, as he now required to learn more lessons of maturity and adulthood. By this point, the young future prince would have much less time for childish antics, and instead, would be expected to begin practicing things such as horsemanship, swimming, the use of a variety of weapons and combat techniques, and formal education in the topics of world history, language, and politics. And drinking blood. Also, oh. during this time, Vlad Dracul submitted to Sultan Murad II of the Ottoman Empire, creating an alliance with the Turks, which lasted only a few short years. <laughs> 
The consequences of this union being ended came in 1442 when Vlad Dracul, accompanied by his two youngest sons, Vlad and Radu, accepted an invitation from Sultan Murad to have a meeting with him in his court. Immediately upon arrival, Vlad Dracul was arrested and chained, and his sons taken away to Egregor's fortress. While okay. Vlad Dracul would only spend a year in Ottoman custody, he agreed to leave his sons in the hands of the Sultan as part of an extensive agreement to secure his freedom and return to Valachia, sworn on both the Quran and the Bible. So, why did they... What did he do that made them turn against him, or they were just dicks? And of course, them keeping his children is going to prevent him from doing anything. But they don't know. This man sleeps in a coffin. He drinks blood. Turns into a bat. Scared of the sun. Somehow, he's always got a British accent, too. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Vlad, around 11 years old at this point, and Radu, roughly 7 years of age, were now alone in a foreign country around people whose language they could not speak nor understand. While specific details and time frames are not clear, we do know that the brothers were initially kept hostage in Egregaz, before later being moved to Tokat and then Adrianople, at which point they would have been brought on trips to other palaces, such as that in Meniza, alongside the Sultan's court. Even as hostages, Vlad and Radu's education would have continued, as one of the Sultan's goals would have been to create a trusted future with Valachian voivodes who would be loyal to the Ottomans. The treatment remained fair, as long as the boy's father stayed true to his agreement. Vlad was known to have been more of a challenging child and teen than his younger sibling. Uncooperative and short-tempered at times, it was not unusual for punishment methods such as the whip to be used in an attempt to... T oh, wait a minute. This is... Vlad. The Impaler. He's the third. Oh, okay, so they... Okay, because then Radu was the bro... So they did this to his dad. Okay... Okay. Came the okay, young Dracula. Okay. In contrast, and likely what sparked the lifelong hatred between the brothers, Radu was recognized as a more agreeable protege, and quickly attracted the attention of both men and women with his exceptional beauty. One of the most notable admirers of Vlad's child brother was the soon-to-be sultan and son of Murad II, Mehmed II the future conqueror of Byzantium. Despite essentially growing up together, Vlad and Mehmed would never spark enough of a friendship to prevent the bloody contention they would later spend their adult lives engaging in. On top of Vlad's unwillingness to fall in line and his new Turkish peers, his father was also beginning to stir the pot back in Valachia. Having previously only sent a minute contingent under his eldest legitimate son Mircha to support the Crusaders of the 1443 Long Campaign, Vlad Dracul was now creeping dangerously close to breaking his promises he made to Sultan Murad. Fortunately, after meeting with the Governor General of Transylvania, John Hunyadi, and seeing the small number of Christian forces, Vlad Dracul opted to once again send no more than a small contingent to assist in the future crusading. As he was still taking a neutral stance himself, he so far <clears throat> had not severely violated his agreement with the Turks, but was still leaving his sons in precarious conditions. Mircha, however, according to Michael Beham, who wrote during the Varna Crusade, is said to have fought bravely in the name of his faith, even utilizing cannons for the first time in Romanian military history. After word of Mircea's involvement got out, the Turks learned of this passive betrayal, and Dracula himself became cognizant of his father's choice to risk he and his brother's lives. Surprisingly though, even once the Ottomans became aware of Dracul's deceit, and despite his own prediction that his sons would be butchered for the sake of Christian peace, Vlad nor Radu were killed or even tortured by the Turks. However, their treatment did become more treacherous in response to Dracul's actions. This 
resulted in the hardening of Vlad's already rough and stubborn personality and an explicit chain of events that led to Radu's ultimate submission to the future Sultan, Mehmed II. Regardless of the differing attitudes between the boys, it can be assumed that Sultan Murad still had intentions of using both of them as puppets of Valachian loyalty, hence his decision to spare their lives. Meanwhile, Murad and Dracul managed to come to a new agreement in the year 1447, around the same time that the already superficial kinship between Vlad Dracul and John Hunyadi faced new challenges. Hazardously, Mircea called for the Transylvanian Governor General's execution in response to his negligent venture at the Crusade of Varna, after Dracul had warned Hunyadi that the Christians did not have the necessary troops to defeat the Turks. Hunyadi was never executed and eventually returned without harm to Transylvania, though his newfound support of Vladislav II, Adaneshti, seems to hardly be a coincidence. In late fall of the same year, backed by John Hunyadi, Vladislav II made the ultimate ultimate decision to take the throne by force from Dracul and Mircea, his attempt aligning with a boyar revolt that led to Mircea being seized, tortured, and subsequently buried alive, followed by Dracul's assassination later in the night. How many times have you dropped heavy objects on your boots only to destroy your feet? Skip ahead. Next Watch ad. this. I can show you how to I get don't the know sweetest what's deals happening. online when you shop for major retailers I don't care. like Amazon Shut and up. Target. You can Shut drop up. prices Shut automatic. Up. Shut up. When the news found its way to Dracula, still in custody of the Sultan, it is said that he swore vengeance against the traitors who tortured and killed his brother and father, promising to kill Vladislav II by his own hand. Whether he had any bitterness left for his father in return for the repeated abandonment he put his sons through is unknown, but for the sake of family, pride, justice, or all, the Voivode in training was not soon to forgive the murderous boyars and his renegade cousin. I know it's a... It's a crap position to put your kids in that, but I think the alternative would have been worse in that maybe the kids were killed in front of the father um, maybe all three of them were killed and I think that I'm not a parent but I'm pretty sure that a parent would agree that they would rather and I hate give their child up willingly if there was an agreement that could be trusted that the kid wouldn't be harmed than to risk that child's death. Some people, you know, might try to fight it off, but I think that if you can trust that there wouldn't be harm brought to your child, you might do that and then try to figure out how you can get it back. So, I don't think that the, the, as a child, you're not in that position to, to mentally to understand that predicament. And maybe he did. Maybe that. Maybe he did. Maybe he, that's kind of why he didn't uh, get so mad. But his anger, Vlad's anger, is probably more at his brother than his father because he's seeing his brother changing. I'm not a psychologist, though. Now a free man, a candidate for the Valachian throne, and an officer in the Ottoman army with the support of an inspired Sultan Murad, the death of Dracula's father gave him a promising start to his adult life. After a failed attempt by John Hunyadi and Vladislav II to defeat the Ottomans at Kosovo Palji, Vlad was in a favorable position to finally make a strong bid for the Valachian throne. With the backing of the Turks, who were the true authority in the current situation due to their military control, success came to Dracula as he ultimately seized power and became Voivode of Wallachia for the first time in 1448. This sudden uprising predictably did not sit well with the Hungarians and the allies of John Hunyadi, who had been taken captive by the Serbian despot George Brankovic after his defeat at Kosovo Polji. Nikolai of Okna, the vice governor of Transylvania, demanded that Vlad come and meet with him to explain the assumed disappearance of Hunyadi and justify his unforeseen coup. 
In a letter of response, Vlad stated that he could not do as the vice governor asked without creating suspicion from the Turks, and that he had no information on the whereabouts of John Hunyadi, but that if he had not been killed in battle, he would wish to establish peace with the governor upon his return to Transylvania. This strategic start to his first reign was effective, but only while his Ottoman aide maintained dominion over the region. Unfortunately for Dracula, Sultan Murad had opted not to follow the fleeing Hungarian army after the recent battle, at which Vladislav II evaded capture, allowing for a quick turning of the tables. Vladislav was able to gather the remainder of Hunyadi's troops, though he fails to free Hunyadi himself before marching into Wallachia and defeating Vlad's army, forcing his Draculesti cousin to flee the principality altogether. After losing the throne to Vladislav, Dracula found himself back in Adrianople with the Turks once again. He sought refuge under Ottoman protection for a short while before fleeing Sultan Murad's court and making his way to the Wallachian neighbor of Moldavia, where he now settled in the court of Bogdan II. Bogdan was the current ruler of Moldavia, but he was also Dracula's uncle, connected through Vlad Dracul's marriage to Bogdan's sister. Father of the later Prince Stephen the Great, Bogdan II allowed the exiled Valachian to remain in his capital city of Suchava, receiving education alongside Stephen and serving in the Moldavian military. This stay lasted from the late 1449 until the fall of 1451, coming to an abrupt end when Bogdan was assassinated by his own brother, Petru Aran. Lacking many viable options, Vlad and Stephen escaped together to Transylvania, knowing full well that it would be imprudent to risk seeking refuge under the eye of John Hunyadi, who had been stripped of his titles of Viceroy of Hungary and Governor of Transylvania, but still maintained military control and the title of Count of Bitstriza, Severin, and Timishara. The young men attempted to make their way to Brashov, heartened by the support of Vladislav's boyar enemies and previous good relations with the councilmen of the city, Vlad felt that this would be their safest option. Of course, John Hunyadi had no intention of allowing this to be the case, and immediately after being informed of the Valachians' presence in February of 1452, commanded the mayor of Brashov to bar Dracula from settling in the city. Whether Vlad and his Moldavian cousin were forced out or instead kept in hiding around the area is not known for certain. Nonetheless, in September of the same year, Vladislav II also sent a letter to the mayor of Brashov upon hearing that his rival was still in the region. Dracula fled again, this time to the nearby town of Sibiu, where word of his presence made its way to the Transylvanian vice governor. In response, Nikolai of Okna decided to hire an assassin to take the pretender down once and for all. Miraculously, Vlad was made aware of his planned demise and was able to elude his potential killer. Forced now to stay in hiding, Dracula remained under the radar while the relationship between John Hunyadi and Vladislav II began to fall apart. Hunyadi, displeased with Vladislav for his softening towards the Turks and their new sultan, Vlad's childhood peer Mehmed II, as well as possibly still angry at his former protege for not freeing him from Serbian imprisonment, began to shift his view of the unrelated relenting Dracula. Former enemies, both political and personally on the part of Vlad, John Hunyadi and Vlad Dracula were now to meet in the Hungarian's palace, <laughs> apparently putting aside any grudge he may have held over the murder of his father and brother. Vlad accepted a position in Hunyadi's army and court and was offered safe residence in Sibiu. Hunyadi, likely willing to let go of their rocky pass due to the Valachians' knowledge of the Turkish forces and mind of Mehmed II from serving five times in the Ottoman army and growing up alongside the current sultan, quickly became Vlad's new military and political mentor. Things truly began looking up for Dracula as he accompanies Hunyadi to the opening of the Hungarian Diet and even to the coronation of the newly of age king of Hungary, Ladislas Posthumus. After swearing allegiance to the king, Dracula was given full support from the Hungarian authority and the Transylvanian Diet to accept the responsibility of defending Transylvania from the Turks at the recommendation of John Hunyadi himself. Still living in the town of Sibiu, Vlad was now essentially mirroring the duties his father had previously been put in charge of between 1431 and 1436. This new position became readily important after the fall of Constantinople as the Turks decided to attack Hungary in what was now 1456. 
Under the order of Jun Hunyadi himself, Vlad was to stay in Sibiu with his army as a defensive force. But only until he saw it fit to strike in Valachia, once again making an effort to seize the throne from his Dineshti rival. Likewise, Hunyadi also gave the go-ahead for Vlad's Moldavian cousin Stephen. Let's talk about better help. If you ever feel anxious, depressed, stressed, overwhelmed by the world being very much on fire, BetterHelp can step in with their fleet of licensed therapists who are trained to listen. Let's just skip to the next ad. As a health coach, I don't know what's happening. new ways to give our bodies the boost they need with the best ingredients possible. Shut up. That's why I recommend my water to care. all my- No one cares. Shut up. Steven. To execute his incursion into the territory of Petru III Aaron and dispose of the Turkish vassal having kicked off his march on Vladislav II in June, with a sundry army of the Hungarians, Romanian mercenaries, boyars, and the support from the cities of Transylvania, by July, Dracula engaged in combat with Vladislav II and fulfilled his promise of revenge for his murdered family members. Meeting his end at the hands of Vlad Dracula himself, Vladislav II Deneshti was no longer voivode of Valachia, giving the title back to his victorious cousin. Vlad's second reign was undoubtedly his most successful, controversial, and by far his longest. Now styled Prince Vlad, son of Vlad the Great, sovereign and ruler of Ungro Valachia, and the duchies of Amlash and Fagarash, Dracula swiftly tackled the challenge to re-establish positive relations with his neighbors, as well as looking into organizing the start of Petru Aran's overthrow in Moldavia for his cousin Stephen. Instantly unsettled by their former vassal's new posture as Voivode, the Turks became suspicious of Vlad's goals and decided to send a group of envoys to speak with him about the presumed payment of a yearly tribute and the free passage of the Turks through Valachia. While Vlad agreed to these terms, he refused to travel to Constantinople to pay the tribute himself, <laughs> likely recalling the outcome when he'd last accompanied his father on the same journey. Yep. Though tensions with the Ottomans were now reduced to a low simmer, Vlad would later spark new confrontations, but not without handling business at home first. Demonstrated by his own words in a letter to the mayor of Brashov, Vlad believed firmly, when a man or a prince is powerful and strong at home, then he will be able to do as he wills. But when he is without power, another one more powerful than he will overthrow him and do as he wishes. Before he could address foreign relations beyond keeping the peace, Vlad needed to consolidate his power at home. The boyars of Valachia were one of the first focuses of Dracula during his second reign. Known for being corrupt and even traitorous at times, the boyar class essentially shared authority with the prince, holding almost more overall power than the voivode himself. With a previous average of about two years of rule for every prince, the boyars had shown their true colors and game of control. They often worked to put the weakest possible candidate on the throne, allowing themselves to maintain ultimate jurisdiction. According to Michael Beheim, Dracula once said to an assembly of these boyars after asking them how many princes they've known, How do you explain the fact that you had had so many princes in your land? The guilt is entirely due to your shameful intrigues. Clearly, Vlad had no desire to let such corruption go unpunished, keeping in mind that he had also sworn revenge on the nobleman responsible for the torture and murder of his older brother. On Easter Day of 1457, just how these deals would be dealt became gruesomely clear. Multiple accounts of this day recall how Vlad first searched for where Mircea was said to be buried, finding his brother's body face down and confirming that the stories of his way of death were true. Knowing wow. this, Vlad the Impaler is about to reveal his true cruelty and anger against the corrupt boyars, who were responsible not only for the death of his family, but for the poverty of the country. Something had to be done. Vlad allowed roughly 200 boyars and their wives to come and celebrate the holiday, as they typically would at the palace in Targoviste. This time, though, as everyone finished their meals, Vlad had his men seize every boyar and wife attending the celebrations. Oh, I thought he was going to poison their food. 
Okay, we're on different pa different wavelengths here. The old were taken beyond the city walls and impaled, while the young Holy and able shit. were marched in chains around 50 miles up the Argesh River, taking about two days to the site of where they were now to build Dracula's new Ponary Castle. This fortress, in addition to being part of a significant power play, was also a breach of Turkish and Hungarian authority, which stated that no vassal may protect themselves with such an addition. Regardless, Vlad had the castle completed and busied himself replacing the disgraced boyars with men of loyalty, many of whom were of low class and former peasants. The new title of wow. Armash, a new position meant for tasks such as handling the execution of criminals against the state, was also an update made under the rule of Dracula. Following this fresh approach, throughout his reign, all of Vlad's appointments of new men to his court were based on who would be loyal to him and only him, as he seemed determined to solidify his position of power and deal with any possible mistrust or betrayal before it could even occur. There becomes apparent a running theme throughout Vlad's time as Voivode that showcases his sometimes irrational response to issues of trust in general possibly rooting itself in the betrayals of his childhood. One example of an overzealous reaction to dishonesty, where we see Dracula's emphasis on the importance of honesty, we're told of a merchant from Florence who found himself in Targovishte on his way to Constantinople, bringing with him a carriage of money and goods. The merchant, upon arrival, went to the princely palace to ask for protection over himself and his goods during his stay in the capital. Vlad simply told the merchant to leave his things in the public square and come sleep in the palace. The merchant obeyed the prince's command, but when he returned to the carriage the following day, he discovered 160 missing gold ducats. After making this disheartening discovery, the merchant returned to Vlad and informed him of the matter. The prince assured him that both the money and the thief would be found, and there was no need to worry. Vlad now ordered the citizens of Targoviste to find the thief, threatening to destroy the city if they did not, and also instructed his servants to replace the merchant's missing money from his own treasury, adding an extra ducat. When the merchant later returned to his carriage, he counted his money again, a total of three times, before going back to notify the prince. He said to Vlad, Lord, I have found all my money, only with an extra ducat. At this time, the thief was being brought to the palace, as Vlad told the merchant, Go in peace. Had you not admitted to the extra ducat, I would have ordered you to be impaled together with this thief. Holy shit. The story of the merchant, much like the anecdote about the golden cup that sat near a fountain in a deserted area to test his subjects and their honesty, which was never stolen nor moved during Dracula's reign, showed his strong stance on morality and justice. Wow. Stop being so nice to women. Nice will never equal turned on or attracted to you. I know you want women to be wildly attracted to you, to approach you first, to uh, win. I want to burp in your face. Why not watch another Why ad I verbo after host? I click skip People ad? People come together from all over to enjoy my place. So I'm making a connection. He was not against tricking his people in order to test their uh. ethics, even being said to have dressed in disguise to roam the villages and observe the pet. I saw that! I saw that face in the corner and I just kind of let- I kind of thought to myself a little chuckle. And I was like, that looks like him. I- and I thought, well, what a stupid thing. I noticed it when he had went back. Sorry, Peasants I just- How well they followed his rules and policies. In general, Vlad was well-loved and supported by the peasants of Valachia, earned through his lack of favoritism towards the rich and noble. No one could buy their way out of punishment or use any form of bribery under Dracula's reign. His disdain was never aimed at the lower class as a whole, but he did have a special hatred for the lazy and the beggars of Valachia. 
Similar in style to the method of punishment used at the Easter feast, Vlad is known for taking a macabre approach to the problems of vagabonds in his land. Written off by the Germans, Russians, and Romanians, the incident of this event is another extreme example of Dracula's determination to enact a new moral code on his principality and to punish those who did not comply. It is said that Vlad invited all the ill, lame, poor, and the like to a large dining hall in Targoviste, where they were given food and drink for all. As the beggars and vagabonds ate and drank until they were most severely drunk, Vlad's men secured the doors to the building and set it on fire. When the fire went out, there were no survivors. The goal, of course, was to eradicate what Vlad saw as a social plague from the land. Dracula said himself, These men live off the sweat of others, so they are useless to humanity. It is a form of thievery. In fact, the masked robber in the forest demands your purse. But if you are quicker with your hand and more vigorous than he, you can escape him. These vagabonds take your belongings gradually by begging, but they still take it. They are worse than robbers. While Vlad's retributions may have been unnecessarily cruel, passed down through the generations of Romanian families are still stories of his kindness and generosity as well, such as the claims of residents today who say that their ancestors were gifted land by Vlad after helping him secretly get from one location to another. A vexed voivode who seemed to do everything to the extreme, Dracula was not stingy with his rewards for those who would do good. This mindset of his may account for his seemingly back-and-forth approach to relations with the city of Brashov throughout the same time period. I, I can see that. If you were loyal, he repaid you. He repaid you like a king. But he tested your loyalty. He tested your loyalty a lot. You know. I'm going to go ahead and it, it just says all parts and I don't know how many parts there are. So I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um, and just assume that there would be a part two. I was looking for a good cut, but there just wasn't one. So I'm going to go ahead and end this here and we're going to jump back into it. Um, well, I'm not going to jump back into it tonight. But uh, when I do, it'll be right here at 2544. So um, until then, I might go back to 25 minute mark. Okay, just, just because. But until then, have a good day, have a good night.